Hey everybody, it's Greg Rice. We're here at Texture in 3D located in Woonsocket, Rhode Island. And we're with our managing member, Mr. Peter Lynch. Peter, how's it going? Yeah, pretty good. Nice to see you. Nice to see you as well. And I'm glad that we're in your shop today. What we're gonna do is show the folks at home a little bit about the business that you do, which is very interesting. And also you brought some show and tell for us too, right? Yeah, sure. So we're gonna look at those, but before we get into that, why don't you take us back maybe to your first job that you ever had, what was that? Um, so actually I started out uh, working in the automation department at a company in Plymouth, Mass that did um, uh, plastic injection molding. And okay. I, uh, I got uh, to work in the uh, tool room with uh, the old guys. Uh, okay. I can kind of learn to, you know, surface grinding and um, polishing and all these different types of things that go into surface finish to get a, a mold really perfect in order to be able to get a good casting. And what year was that? No, that was back in uh, 1990, yeah, 91 or so. Got it. So yeah. you're like 30 years deep in the business. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And what made you get started? Was it maybe a dad, a grandfather, an uncle? Like, how did you kind of gravitate towards working with your hands? So actually, I think it was um, uh, my my grandfather who um, basically raised me was into uh, uh, radio controlled cars, and um, he couldn't uh, assemble them or put them together or do anything with them, but he liked to uh, drive them and so forth. So I, I started like I just got into it with them and started putting it together, and then um, it just it became a lot of fun, and then that, that kind of sort of attracted me to like wanting to like make the little pieces and the components yep. and stuff. And then um, I ended up going to a trade school for um, uh, industrial technology and um, worked on like packaging machines and stuff. When uh, Procter & Gamble used to be in Quincy, Mass, they sponsored mm -hmm. the program. And it was a small program. It doesn't exist at the school anymore because it was uh, funded by Procter & Gamble and they spent a lot of money like on God. equipment and whatever. And part of the exchange was they would send um, their uh, engineers and staff and stuff to to the school at which was like completely outfitted with like state-of-the-art stuff and um, they would do their training and basically me and one of the kids that got accepted into the program um, got to like learn with these uh, you know actual professionals and stuff and it was it was a pretty good experience so, you know we would um, rebuild uh, ivory soap machines and different bottling machines and things like that and then they closed the plant in Quincy and moved to Cincinnati and got uh, that was the end of that program, but um, I was lucky enough to be like the last class yeah. that went through it. Yeah. And what tech school was that? Uh, that was uh, South Shore of Tech in uh, Hanover, Mass. And what year about was that? Maybe 2000 you yeah. changed? Yeah, I graduated in 94. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, late 90s into the 2010, what happened during that decade for you? So, um, actually, so I, uh, I ended up getting accepted to go to Wentworth. Oh. And um, yeah, so, and then um, after school, and I end up uh, right, right before I actually started, I end up coming down with Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is like a form of cancer. And I had, uh, it was like stage four cancer actually. And um, it, so school didn't happen. Yeah. And um, uh, so I, I did that and uh, for, dealt with that for a bit. And then um, my grandparents who had come like from Italy and or uh, Sicily, and the, yeah, yeah, be careful on that, right? <laughs> and uh, um, the, you know, my grandfather used to say all the time, like, uh, you, you know, why can't you make like a pizza shop or some kind of business or whatever, or something like that? Like, and um, I was like, oh, no, that's what I want to do with my life. So, um, it, but it was in my head that like I, I needed to do something. So I had a lot of uh, debt uh, from medical bills and different yeah. things like that because, um, you know, I was a stupid kid and I picked like the, the cheapest insurance to save, yeah. you know, the 50 bucks kind of thing. And um, so I ended up getting a job uh, in like about 96 or so, um, traveling around fixing equipment, like doing uh, electronic um, uh, placement machines for print circuit boards. Mm. So, um, so I would do that and then I would, and I started to realize that 90% um, of the problem with the machines was that they would go to like a local machine shop, have some kind of fixture made. It wouldn't be made um, you know, very precisely uh, or at least as precise as the machines were, and so the chips wouldn't go in the right places. They'd call, like, saying, like, oh, the machine's broken, but really it was what they were placing the parts on wasn't God. centered or whatever. So I, um, I started my first business uh, 
uh, so I, I, I basically quit quit my job. It was a great idea that I was going to go into business for myself. And I started my grandparents' garage with a, um, a bridge port, and um, I uh, started building these fixtures for people. And um, between '98 and um, I guess 2007, I had uh, started this uh, shop. It, it ended up uh, growing to about uh, $12 million a year and mm -hmm. um, it, it had about 65 employees. Wow. So, um, and that was in Mass? Yeah, yeah. So, but, uh, but unfortunately, it was in, uh, involved in like a fire and so forth. And wow. uh, so then I had moved to um, uh, DC. I had some contracts and stuff that were with um, uh, the DOD and stuff. So, uh, for building military robots and stuff like that. So, I moved out there and helped uh, set up a facility that did water jet cutting and um, mm -hmm. machining of, of these components and stuff. So I did that for a bit and then I'd come back here and um, uh, my, my son lives in uh, Alabaro, Mass with his mom and stepdad. Okay. And um, you know, I just wanted to be around him more and was realizing yeah. that you know, it was too far away and the flights back and forth were yeah. adding up and stuff. So I, um, I'd come back and I'd taken a, a job um, at another company that um, did surface finishing. and. In my experience, I always had like machine shops, and we did um, all the surface finishing. Um, uh, you know, in in the machine shop, you know, we would make the part, then we would sand it, we would tumble it, we do all these different little things, which is generally what most all machine shops do. Mm. And um, going to this other company, I really didn't think that their business model was actually feasible because I was like, you know, there's no, no shops going to want this. Mm -hmm. But then I started to realize that you can kind of be that jack of all trades or in the master of none sort of, mm -hmm. or, or you can just really hone in and specialize on one thing. And, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, being in their shop, they were more of a, a distributorship type of company and they didn't really have like the engineering staffing and so forth like that. So I um, had, had kind of saw that there was like a different direction that it could go in with, um, you know, adding, you know, custom automation and all mm -hmm. different things. And um, they were more of a distributor. So they're kind of more of like the, you know, buy the equipment off the shelf. And if it, if it, um, if it can do this part, then, then great. And like, if it can't, it's outside of that scope, then it can't be done. And um, I was kind of more from the, the thinking, you know, between like my experience with like building automation and, um, you know, I guess way back to like the first job we spoke about, like, you know, having some like widget that um, uh, that needs to be like picked and placed into something and, and do, you know, 50,000 pieces and you don't want an operator to sit there mm -hmm. and do it, be, do, it, do it economically, like and you've got to engineer and create the thing. And um, so I, I was like, it's it's doable. And, um, you know, it's, it's doable without spending a ton of money, really, you know, if you surround yourself with some smart people that come up with some cool ideas and right. you know you can find a way so um that's kind of, kind of what we're doing here so we've got a few different little projects where we have uh, things that, that uh, have come up that like no, no one's really solved the problem for it. and um, we're finding like little niches like some um, one one of our major potential customers does um hypodermic needles hmm. and they're um uh, very very small bore like uh Ten thousandths of an inch, which is basically the size of dental floss, right. and um, they need to polish the inside and get it like super duper smooth, um, almost like to a mirror finish. And um, the only way that you can usually do it is, uh, you know, if you put it onto like a lathe and you go through right. or whatever. But um, it's not very economical, um, especially if you have fifty thousand, hundred thousand parts. Right. So um, we, we've worked on like a way to to use like um, a glass media, and, like water, and like inject it into the tubes and basically create another way to yeah. do it and then create a little bit of automation that will like feed them through and mm -hmm. stuff. So that's, um, it, it hasn't come together a hundred percent yet, but uh, the potential for it is, is pretty huge. So how about this? In 10 words or less, tell the folks at home what texture in 3D does. We create uh, uh, surface modifications. Perfect. Yeah. So any type of metals you're saying? Yeah, metals or plastics or things. If uh, somebody wanted, uh, you know, a bumpy surface on a piece of plastic or a super smooth uh, surface, or uh, you know, they're making like a, a handgun or a fishing rail and or right. something, and they want it to like 
hold and grip onto it. Like we'd put that texture on. Like so you have some show and tell for us here. Yeah. So this would be like an example of this is we didn't do this part. This is um, like just a standard chrome part that would be on a motorcycle, but they wanted it to be grippy. So ah. so we put this kind of texture onto it. So is this like the foot pedal or something? Yeah. Yeah. So then a part would get molded over that. So this grippiness is what would. Um, when they put the epoxy or whatever on it would hold it on Got there it. like right so you modify metal you know any type of metal yeah. specifically for what the use is and we'll we'll throw that up in the camera here you yeah, can so see you, that you can see like that it's got kind of a more of a aggressive profile to it so it's like textured and compared to the, the polished chrome yeah so this this here would look um, unfortunately i don't have like the before but um, so this is stainless steel, and so this kind of coloring and whatever that kind of covers all of the the machine lines and, and all like the little scratches and stuff you would see, um, we make all that disappear. So, so that it looks finished. You put this in a blaster of some sort. Yep. And what did you use to to so, clean this? Yeah. So that's actually done with a process called vapor honing. So we. Um, it's basically uh, sandblasting, as, as people would know, except that it uses um, hydraulic pressure of water and uh, mixing with uh, like a glass media, and then it sprays it out at like a, about 100 psi, and uh, then the operator has to be skilled in order to make sure there's no shadows or yeah. anything like that. But um, but it's a pretty simple process, really. That looks pretty good. Yeah, and uh, then we've got other things like these are components. Um, for the dental industry. Um, so this is kind of like how it comes raw. Is this the thing that they, uh, with the mirror? Yeah. That they put in your mouth? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, and then this is, um, they wanted to see an example of it being shiny, but shiny doesn't actually work for uh, the dental industry and stuff because it's too reflective in the, yep. or whatever. So, um, so they kind of go with something more, more like this. So they sent you how many of these to, to polish and kind of dull? So we usually do like lots of like 300 at a time or so. Interesting. Yeah. So, so. any, any your customer base could be anybody in yeah, the any, world. Yeah, basically. Any, any, anybody who manufactures anything. When you get a, um, a, a MacBook computer or an a, a Apple a phone or something, for example, not to use their name, but if you, you everybody's used to that gray color mm. that's on the other that thing. That's all like uh, sandblasted finish. Um, the, 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 so like the phones you're saying? Yeah. So or how about like this cover that I have here? This yes. This is a metallic cover. That yeah. So exactly. So this this metallic cover. So this is done with a process called anodizing. And actually, one of our major customers is right around the corner, um, Precision Coating. They do this kind of anodizing work. Hmm. So they will put the color in and so forth. But um, they can only make it look as good as what the underlying surface is. So mm -hmm. that's what we do. So we make sure that the underlying surface has got no like little pits or dings or right. uh, or anything like that. So that when they put the color on it, it looks right. You know, if you just took a raw piece of metal and you anodized it, you would see the grain of the metal and, and all that sort of thing. And you know, from from one piece of stock to another, it wouldn't look consistent. So mm -hmm. that's what we do is make it. We hide the defects. Got it. And uh, last week I actually came to Peter's shop with my dad and he gave us a tour. He showed us some of the machines that you have and what you can do. And one thing that he did for me was clean up my ring. I have a uh, ring here, a skull ring. And what I'm going to have him do today again is re-clean it for me because I got concrete in it again. So I want you to show us, we'll follow you around with the camera on what you'll do, what machines to, to clean this and, and make it look like new. Sound good? Yeah, sounds good. Cool. So this machine here is uh, what I was describing before. It's the known as a wet blast machine or a vapor honing machine. And basically it uses a um, glass media, uh, the same as you would use in a air blast cabinet, sand blast cabinet, um, except that you mix 50% uh, water with 50% of the sand. And um, basically what happens is it pumps up a mixture of the water and sand, and then the, um, air pressure comes in and mixes with it at the same time. So what happens is, is with traditional um, air blasting, the little glass beads will basically hit the metal and like peen it. And so they'll like just be like impacting it and smashing into it and it'll kind of give it like a, a ripple type effect. 
with um, this process, what it's actually doing is more of a, like almost like a rock at the beach where it, it basically is sliding the beads over the metal. So it, it creates a, a really good uh, cleaning ability where the water is washing away any kind of oils, greases, or, or dirt at the same exact time as it's also like using an abrasive um, to kind of slide over and get into all the little nooks and crevices and everything. And um, it, it works quite well. But you change the media. Um, we use some medias for, um, you know, cleaning off rust and paint and nasty stuff that might be on, on like a, a piece of equipment that might be in service at a, uh, a factory or something. And they have like, they'll set an assembly with like greasy shafts and bearings and all sorts of stuff. And um, one of the good things about that is that we can do everything here in like a closed loop system. It basically will degrease it, wash it, and put the degreaser in there. And then, um, you know, you can be environmentally conscious and then take it and put it into a, um, a barrel and send it to someplace like Clean Harbors or whatever and dispose of it. And um, if, you, if you tried to clean all that sort of stuff um, any other way, you would have to, you know, put it into a degreasing tank or something like that, which is kind of nasty. If you tried to just blast it off with the air blasting, all the media and stuff would just stick to the grease or it would just contaminate the grease. And then now all of a sudden you have like a whole bunch of, you know, sand or glass or whatever full of oil and what do you do with that? So this is like a much more environmental way to, to handle it. Going on here, this is just regular water. Um, so, actually, so we use a uh, reverse osmosis process. So, basically, it, uh, it takes out all of the uh, uh, metals and minerals and things like that. Um, and we try to have it like be as close to zero parts per million. Um, so, basically, if a part is going to be anodized or plated or painted or anything, what will happen is if you use like aluminum or different things, if you don't, um, if you wash it with regular water. Um, you end up with spots on the parts. God, oh, yeah, just like a car wash. God, cool. Or it, um, sometimes uh, the water will have some kind of mineral that will sit on the surface, and then when it goes to the plating company, their process they usually done with uh, you know, chemicals and electricity, and sometimes yeah. they'll react and it'll turn things white or make spots or change the hue. Yeah. So, so we are like super careful on it. Yeah. So this is the finished product. Yeah. Wow, look at that. So um, one of our customers is actually a, a major uh, gun uh, firearms manufacturer up in uh, New Hampshire. And they're doing some experimentation with different types of media to create different uh, looks and have their coatings and so forth uh, adhere to the gun better to, like, to work in um, you know, conditions like the Middle East or something like that or whatever. So that it needs to like really grip. So um, basically we need to make sure that there's a certain specific uh, surface uh, finish on here in order to be able to, um, to have the paint or the coatings or whatever you want to call it adhere to it. So um, basically we use this probe and we sit it on, on here and then uh, it's as simple as just uh, pressing a button basically. And this um, probe will like, come across about a quarter of an inch or so. And what it's doing is it's it's measuring basically how like how microscopically basically like how bumpy that surface is and then it, it's calculating an average so it's saying that the roughness average is um, 46 micro inches so um, we have like a range of what they want it's about 50 so we're kind of doing some experimentation and stuff to get it up to the 50 without going over the 50 <laughs> so yeah, basically that you you change that by um, basically hitting the part a little harder with more air pressure and it'll make it more rough. You know? So, you know, so we're close, but you know, still not there yet. So what do we got going on here, Pete? So this is actually um, kind of the fun stuff or whatever, um, not, not so fussy like medical or, you know, Department of Defense type stuff. So this is uh, just a motorcycle bar. This is for an old vintage uh, Triumph motorcycle the guy was uh, restoring. So 
we did this in the same machine that we just did your your ring in. Okay. Uh, so it was done with the uh, uh, vapor degreasing and uh, water blasting. So instead of sitting there and polishing this thing like with a, a brush and trying to get in all the nooks and crannies and everything and waste his entire Saturday, um, he was able to uh, just drop it off and yeah. for really short money, like you know, like fifty bucks, and just and it's done. Yeah. So, so this is the old part. Yep. Yeah. So, so this is how it would be. Take a look at that at home. Nasty, black, dirty, greasy, smelly. And then here's after how long? Yeah, this takes us maybe like 30 minutes. Wow. Yeah. Hold so, that up to the camera, show the folks at home. Yeah. It looks brand new, Pete. Yeah, I mean, you can see uh, you know, the camera probably a little closer. You the brass and all the different pieces and stuff like that. So this is something that you also do is, is folks who maybe have a hobby, maybe they're a motorcyclist, um, any any metal surface yeah. can be made to look brand new. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and it also, uh, I'll show you in the other room, um, when we sandblast uh, like larger parts, like uh, like we've got a couple motorcycle frames and different things I can show you, but um, the media that we use, we actually, we also distribute it. It's called 10X, it's like a special engineered media that um, doesn't leave any residue or anything. So uh, like ordinary, um, like aluminum oxide or different types of traditional medias will leave salts and minerals and mm. so forth on the on the, the material. And in a short amount of time, it'll flash rust. So you'll start to get rust and stuff again. So if you don't immediately paint it or whatever, with this media, we literally let things just sit around for months yeah. and nothing you know, uh, and the folks at home, media, you keep saying, what is media? So media is you know, what actually goes into the machines um, that's like the abrasive. So it. Um, so it, that's what's cleaning the, the metal or the ring. Or, right. Yeah, exactly. So, so go so, through the different types of them. Yeah. So you, you, this uh, is like a billion different types, but traditionally um, it's either like crushed glass, glass beads, um, walnut shells, um, uh, some people will use like um, uh, like a, a material called like Black Beauty, or um, you know, you're not supposed to use uh, regular uh, sand because it's silica and OSHA, but mm. a lot of people still do it. They shouldn't do it. it it'll so get into, because it's what? It's very dangerous. It'll get into your lungs, and then um, uh, you, you can't get it out, and it'll it'll really cause a lot of breathing problems. So really, even if you use masks and stuff, so. We use all um, medias that are, uh, you know, compliant with OSHA and that um, won't hurt employees and cool. so forth. Yeah. That's important. You don't yeah. want your people dying. Yeah, that, that would make a bad, <laughs> bad situation. So um, cool. So you want to head into the big room there? We'll we'll yeah. show the folks home. The big room is like Pete said, where they'll bring big items like a motorcycle frame. What else would you take into this room and, and yeah, um, so machine like machine frames. Uh, if somebody had like a, I don't know, some kind of a packaging machine, or uh, you know, it could be like some large part that goes to like a Humvee for the for yeah. the government, or it could be you know fenders for a car, or just anything that's up to twenty. Um, and we can handle a twenty feet by uh, about eighteen feet. That's so good size. Yeah. Um, we're limited uh, to what we can get through the door, but uh, right. uh, that's um, so. We're typically right now we do a lot of like frames and jigs and things like that that we used in the medical industry for um, that go into like robots that uh, they'll load their product onto it and then it will like paint it or uh, use some kind of coating. It'll go onto it and then um, that coating builds up on their fixture, right? And it needs to be stripped and removed, and that's. Um, that's a, a big bulk of the work that we do in that room. Cool. We'll head in right now. Yeah, sure. So is this what you use to kill the employees? Yeah. <laughs> pretty much. It's pretty fun, actually. So this is, uh, this can take you around this whole space. Yeah. And the user will just... Yeah, so the, um, the user will they have to put on this, uh, this helmet. Um, so... Uh, basically, you would put this on, and then this is feeding oxygen in for the person to be able to breathe so that not breathing all the dust and all the yeah. and stuff. Um, we exhaust from the uh, dust collection system, but you still don't want to breathe. Yes, yeah. what's in here. 
So, um, so basically, the operator would basically press in the safety lock and then hold this down, and then this would get charged with air pressure, and it would spray this media that you see all over the floor um, through the nozzle here, and then blast things, and it, it can move uh, material very quickly. So this is where you put the media? Yeah, yeah exactly. So um, this, this is like basically the best brand um, pie you can, you can get. Um, it's special like meter valve and so forth, so it, it, it um, is like very efficient. Um, and it makes a big, very even, nice spray and so forth. But basically the media will get dumped into here and then it fills up. And then when you turn the air pressure on, um, basically there's like a little ball inside that pops up. Then this whole vessel gets uh, pressurized. And then, then this is like 150 PSI mm -hmm. all the way to here. And then once you release that, you have like 150 PSI. So it's definitely, when you're holding this thing, it's definitely pushing you yeah. back a little bit. Like so, fire hose, like yeah, you said. Yeah, it's, it's a very um, uh, labor intensive job, but like um, you definitely get tired after, you know, six or seven hours just doing it. Oh like, yeah. It's a lot of work. And this hose is pretty heavy. It's pretty heavy. heavy. So we, we rig it up like this to take some of the weight off of people, yeah. but it's still... It's still hanging on yeah. it. Yeah. It's a pretty good idea. Yeah. So, Cool, man. Yeah. Well, what do you call this room? The so, great room? Yeah, so this is um, the blast room. The blast room. Yeah, so and, and we have um, rubber floors on it too. So um, that's that's meant so if we have a part that the customer sends in, like, particularly for our medical customers, um, they'll send in like a stainless steel part and they don't want uh, any carbon steel to get put onto it. Um, one one uh, customer does you know, like x ray machines and so forth. So, any kind of carbon would set off alarms and mm -hmm. things like that, and, and get false reading. So they're like super hypersensitive that the surface is like clean. There's no contamination. So um, we use the rubber floor so that nothing keeps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nothing will like get into it. Where most um, like big cabinets or machines or other blast rooms that you could buy have like they're all made out of like basically like a Connex container more or less, mm -hmm. and um, so it's all steel. So as you're blasting. Um, you'll get the steel and so forth mixed into the media. Right. And if you do recycle your media now, you're like putting metal shavings basically into right. the thing and then defeating all the purpose. So we, um, when we do the jobs like that, we only use the material one time. Got it. And then um, uh, it basically has to be thrown away. So, so those jobs become costly because you can't reuse the material, but, um, but they know it's super clean because it's all virgin brand new material. Yeah. Cool, so now we'll head up in the front and we're going to talk about what? The process that you mentioned? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah basically like our uh, process control and so Awesome. Stuff. So Peter, why don't you tell us about this desk that you made? Uh, so this is kind of a um, uh, neat little product. So we're kind of bootstrapping and uh, uh, broke and trying to figure out like how to, you know, make the place look decent, like cheap. So um, the mill building here had been uh, is being in the, in the process of being rebuilt and so forth. So there was a pile of um, like scrap parts and so forth. So from like windows and things. So we uh, kind of reutilized them. So we took one of the window uh, tops and made that the top part. Then we found some old fire doors with some tin and then um, basically like uh, just molded it over yeah. it and so forth. And then the whole the rest of it is also still made out of pallets and um, awesome. little pieces of metal and stuff that we found. So. Um, I'm lucky to have like one of our employees, uh, Matt. He's like crazy creative, and he wanted to do this type so of this, project. So. If you're at home, imagine this. I will show you. Uh, there's actually one out in the yard that I'll show him. This was the top of a window sill. Yeah, yeah. Right. So if you can imagine this getting flipped up, and then this was the top sill with bricks. This had bricks over it, right? Yeah, yeah just like that one right there. So why don't you tell us about your process? Oh. Yeah, so basically, as far as our process goes, when a customer um, basically gives us an order, we'll call and we confirm the uh, the pricing and make sure that like that everybody's on the same page with everything, and then um, uh, we read over like exactly what they are looking to have done. If there's any special specs like to meet for military standards or um, you know for their specific paint or coating or whatever they might be doing later on, and then. Um, uh, will make recommendations if something isn't in there, what what they should add to make sure that it comes out the way they want. Then once we get past that part, then we um, entered into our system, create like a, a, a work order for the, the guys up there. 
and then um, any kind of process that, that is required, we have it all um, on tablets. So the uh, if it's a job to like, uh, that, that comes up all the time, like somebody coming in with a motorcycle part, this might not really apply. But if somebody's got a, um, you know, like a, a bone um, a screw or something like mm -hmm. that, that's like we're doing it over and over and over again all the time, we'll have a process for it of, you know, this is the, the air pressure, this is the, the media, this is uh, the distance from from the nozzle and how fast and slow to move to the part and all, all these different things. Or if, um, if it's done like with automation, then um, there'll be step-by-step -step instructions of how to like um, load the machine, operate the machine, set it up, like what's required, whatever. So that um, basically, you know, as, as we grow, any employee will be able to perform the same function just mm -hmm. like another employee. And we're, uh, we do all the training and so forth like that to make sure everybody's uh, on the same page and then um, as somebody is operating on a part we have another person that does like the quality control part so somebody is al always basically standing next to the person do doing the blasting right. so as the parts come out they're looking at them cleaning them double checking them see if anything is not not good and um, so it's kind of like an in-process um, quality control step or whatever yeah and then um, then from there, then the parts will, um, if they're all complete, they'll go over to our final inspection where we'll then usually take a certain percentage of the parts and then go through all of them or if the customer uh, wants, wants to pay for it, then we'll look at every single part and uh, package it or do something different. Got it. And then from there, like we might do some other step like, you know, um, laser marking or stamp the parts or put a part number on it or put them in a bag and put, put a, a stamp on the bag. Or, Whatever, whatever so they you might can want. You customize however the, the, the client or the yeah. customer wants. Yeah, exactly. So basically, we can get it so that it, you know, if, and if we've done several parts for them and they want it assembled, we'll also uh, provide like the assembly service and then okay. put in their own custom boxes or whatever they, they want. Awesome. Yeah. And if uh, the folks at home want to get in touch with you, if they want to learn more about Texture in 3D, how do they reach out? Um, so the website is uh, www.texturein3d.com and um, that's probably the best best way to reach out to us or uh, sales at texturein3d.com and all the phone numbers and everything like that is, is right there on the website. Perfect. Cool. Cool, man. Well, once again, Peter, appreciate your Thank time. You appreciate you know, the tour of your facility here and folks at home, if you have any questions, throw them down in the video here below and we'll get right back to you. And once again, this is Greg Rice from Nexus here with Peter of Texture in 3D here on Socket. Rhode Island, your property managed.